Your extensive publishing career includes to date nine books, five of which have won national awards and recognition, and more than 175 articles, chapters, and editorials on social justice, practitioner research, and teacher education research practice and policy. What else would you like to accomplish that you have not done yet? Well, you know, one of the questions that I didn't really answer uh, that you asked me a few minutes ago was, you know, how could we reverse some of oh, the sure. policies that are in place that are uh, not going in the direction in that, a research -based yeah, way. that you and I have been talking about. And one thing I would love to do, and I, of course, this is beyond any individual, but to write something so powerful that people would see the insanity of some of what is now going on and some of what is now being emphasized in the policy world. In the sense, for example, of equating students' learning with test scores mm. and equating teacher effectiveness with test scores and equating the quality of teacher preparation programs with test scores. I, I'm not questioning accountability. Sure. I'm questioning that equation. I think it's way too simplistic. I think it doesn't, um, it doesn't have a broad view of what students' learning is. It's not just test scores. What about preparing people to live and work in a democratic society? What about preparing students to think about issues of equity and justice? And, and how do they live with other people in our so diverse increasingly diverse society. I mean, I just think the narrowness of what, where we're going policy-wise is really, really problematic. And it's as, if we, it's as if we think accountability, let's lead with accountability. And if we just have more accountability, stricter accountability, better accountability, better data systems, that's going to solve everything. It's right. like data will, will save us. Yes. I don't think data will save us. Uh, and I'm not opposed to gathering evidence and asking important questions and using data and evidence to explore those questions. But I think we're really going in the wrong direction in this country. And um, you know, as far as teacher preparation goes and as far as teacher quality goes, then we ought to have more emphasis on professionalism and teacher development over time and inquiry communities that sure work to, to, to wrestle with their hardest, toughest questions and people being willing to unlearn some of the biases that they come with because we all come with those. Sure. Uh, so that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to, and I've been struggling with this actually for several years, to what is a project that I could undertake that would somehow, it will not be so powerful that it will change everybody's mind, obviously, but is there some Dream big. Piece. <laughs> Is there some piece, small piece, that would make people go, you know, that's really, Profound. that's really, we, we need to think about that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's possible given where we are in this country where it yeah, just seems. It must be possible. You think? <laughs> I, think it, I think it needs to be. I, I don't think there could be more of a dire need for yeah. that, that. So we've got to figure out a way to, yeah. to do that. What impact has your research had of which you are most proud? Well, there are probably two things. Um, well, maybe there are three. Going back to things we've already talked about. Um, one is the work I've done with Susan on teacher research and inquiry. We've had many people who've written to us saying, this changed my life. Mm. Uh, this made it possible for me to continue to be a teacher. Sure. This helped raise new questions I hadn't thought of. This gave me, and I don't mean like this had this miraculous effect, but these ideas Inspired. allowed me to work with sure. others and, and really do that. That's, sure. that's one. The whole idea of social justice and equity and diversity issues in, in teacher education over a long period of time, you know, including the scale we developed, but including the idea of teaching against the grain from almost 30 years ago now. Mm. Um, that whole body of work. Um, and then the, the third area is a, is a lot of the work that I concentrate on now, which has more to do with policy and trying to unpack these current policies. Uh, and the, the kind of writing I did in some of those editorials, yeah, sure. <clears throat> where people say, this really helped me understand. I mean, those are, 
those are things I think that I'm proud of and uh, hope to continue to do more of. What inspires you? Well, really good writing inspires me. Uh, really clear writing about complicated things. I think that so much of what you read in the educational world is filled with jargon, is filled mm. with um, convoluted sentences and what almost appears sometimes to be sort of intentional obfuscation, you know. Sure. So good, clear, strong writing about really important ideas and complex ideas inspire me. And I, I tell my students all the time, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to write in a, in, a, in a dense, hard to understand way just because you're dealing with complex important ideas. You can write about complex things in clear ways. So, so that in part inspires me. Um, people who can write with um, imagination and creativity and clarity sure. about complicated things. What do you find uninspiring? Uninspiring. I think a lot of the sort of same old, same old rhetoric um, uh, 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 work that is, and, and I don't just mean academic work, but work in the media, work in the policy uh, deliberations among politicians, where it's sort of intentionally constructing, here's the enemy, here's the bad guy, um, here's the thing that, uh, this is the status quo, which is, it, it is in, it is, almost intentionally ignoring the, the much more complex picture of things. Uh, and I think we've had so much of that now sure. for so long. Uh, and, the, and some of the same people use the same sort of rhetorical strategies to construct a group as the anti-reform. When, yes. we, when we all know, or some of us know, it's, it's a lot different from that. So, so further embedded yeah. assumptions. That I, yeah certainly find not just uninspiring but frustrating and depressing. Yes. What is your favorite word? My favorite word? Well, for now, I think I'll say complexity. Okay. What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be in the, in the interview? It's up to you. Well, I suppose the F word is uh, one of the has, top favorites. Uh, well, it has so many uses. Um, sort of an all-purpose, multi-purpose word uh, <laughs> for complex purposes. Yes. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you have liked to attempt? I I used to say, and maybe I've still say, said this recently. I think if I hadn't been what I am, or hadn't become what I have become, I think I would have been interested in constitutional law. Because I think, again, there's, and I don't know that much about the work, but what I know about it, analysis in that area seems to involve unpacking and trying to get at the uh, core of arguments and how arguments are built and what kind of precedents they have and how they connect. So, And often has to do with issues related to justice sure. and equity. So That's at your core. Yeah. What profession other than your own would you have not liked to attempt? probably regular lawyering, <laughs> um, anything involving sales. Uh, for a long time, people have asked me, why haven't you become a dean? Why aren't you a dean somewhere? Oh, sure. And uh, I have always answered, one of the reasons is, when I was a little girl, I never liked to sell Girl Scout cookies, and I still don't. Now, you may or may not know what I mean by that, but as I understand from many of my friends who are deans, in most institutions, at least in the U.S., much of the work is about fundraising. Sure. And I'm not, not a fundraiser. No, <laughs> okay. no, not, not going to sell those Girl Scout cookies. If you could tell President Obama one thing, what would it be? Have more complicated understandings of what is going on. Um, don't think teachers and schools can fix everything. Because some of the time he acts like he knows that, yes. you know, and he yeah. put, we want to put more into early childhood and um, even uh, prenatal health care and all of that. And other times it seems like when he comes to education, then 
the vision shifts. So um, race to the top is doing a lot of harm. Let's let's think in a little more complex way about what's really going on. Going sure. If you could have dinner with anybody dead or alive, who would it be? Well, I'd love to have the challenge of uh, having dinner with John Dewey and uh -huh. see if you know. Maybe he would be easier to talk to than he is to read. <laughs> yes. uh, but certainly his ideas are enduring and powerful, and everyone in education cites him and seems to have been, even those who probably have never read anything he wrote. Are influenced um, by him in some way. Yeah, so that, that, would be, that would certainly be interesting. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? All your friends are here waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard. Finally, what advice might you offer graduate students and beginning researchers who hope to make a contribution like you someday? No, I actually w have been asked this, and, and I was asked to give a presentation about some of these issues at one point. And I told them that story that I told you about how colleagues early in my uh, assistant professor days said, if you want to get tenure, you better get out of teacher education. Mm -hmm. And I use that and then make the point that you, you need to do what you believe in. You need to do research about the questions that are uh, at your core, and you need to stick with those questions, even if they're not the most popular questions or the most easily funded mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. grant projects. Um, because you're going to spend an awful lot of time with those questions over the years. And so, um, it has to be what you really care about, and what you're passionate about, and what you believe in. When asked to capture the essence and nature of Marilyn Cochran Smith, your close friend and former graduate student, Alan Emsis, describes your willingness to graciously host receptions for graduate students at the annual meetings of the American Educational Research Association, as we know AERA, and you've done this over the years, always greeting each student personally at the door. He notes that it, this illustrates how you are able to combine professional and personal experiences in ways that pi people find inviting, encouraging, and authentic. Your friend and colleague, Kurt Dudley Marling, writes that you are one of the most generous people he has ever known. You are generous to friends and colleagues alike. Your professional accomplishments are significant, significant but you have touched more lives with your generosity than ever. Your friend and colleague, Ana Maria Villegas, echoes this sentiment, writing about your personal and professional qualities, including deeply felt convictions about social issue, issues of social justice, clear thinking, a strong sense of professionalism, boundless energy, collegial style, and a warm personality. You, have also, you also have a very playful side. You thoroughly enjoy social situations, especially after long days of meetings and intense <laughs> work. You've had much fun together, I understand. Your friend and colleague from New Zealand, Lexi Grudnoff, describes you as stylish in manner and appearance in the sense of being chic, elegant, and classy. You also are a very stylish communicator as well. Your writing is beautiful, polished, accessible, but not simplistic, with clear and compelling arguments. Similarly, your oral presentations are lessons in how to present with style and persuasion. Your friend and colleague from Israel, Lily Orland Barak, describes you as an exceptional human being gifted with a brilliant intellect and a magical soul. Sharp and soft, critical and sensitive, <laughs> strong-minded and tolerant, caring, compassionate, and driven by a true belief that educational research must be educational. Susan Lytle reflects on your work, explaining that you have always been concerned about interrogating and making sense of the relationships of educational theory, research, policy, and practice as enacted in schools and universities, and again, from a social justice perspective. Finally, Kelly Demers, your former doctoral student, notes that you helped her make the trans transition from a curious classroom teacher to a competent and committed teacher educator and that, in short, her relationship with you has been one of the most transformative experiences in her professional life. Uh -oh. Those are all your colleagues and friends. Then on to your family. Uh-oh. Your son, Brad, describes your role as a grandmother to his two-year-old daughter, Riley, explaining that you love her very much and make every effort to have her know you. To Brad, this exemplifies who you are. 
He adds that every second of your time is dedicated to something. When you're visiting with him, him and his family, you're 100% with them. When you're working, you're 100% making a difference. He also said your most significant accomplishment is truly that he and his siblings do not have any criminal records, <laughs> are not wanted by the IRS or the FBI, <laughs> and have not had to spend any significant time in any sort of therapy. <laughs> he thanks you for being a <laughs> foundational, wonderful mother in that regard. He also thanks you for the eternal gift you give him every Christmas. Foreign mustard? <laughs> 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 Your son, Michael, agrees, noting that you work hard and have, have earned everything you have received, but that you still have compassion and empathy for those less fortunate. He recalls a similar time when he wanted to play the saxophone, <laughs> and you made sure that that was to happen, even though there wasn't enough room for saxophones in the class. That was the first time he realized in awe how truly awesome you are. And finally, your husband, Larry, summarizes your dedication, writing that your belief in what you are defending and promoting underlies all of your research, writing, teaching, conversation, and political actions. He adds that you are not an ardent, shrill fire ban in your various teacher education research roles. Larry praises your commitment to defending and promoting respect and dignity for teachers, teaching and teacher education, and a commitment to prompting and defending equity and access to education every day, every hour, and every minute. <laughs> While there is no doubt that in the words of one of your other colleagues, we view you as one of a small group of elite scholars who have changed the face of teacher education, not only here in the United States, but across the world. Your influence has been felt in universities and school systems across the, the country and the world as you have traversed the globe in an effort to improve the quality of scholarly reflection and day-to-day -day practice in teacher education. So on behalf of all of us, educators, scholars, future educationists, educational researchers, and the like, we thank you, Dr. Marilyn Cochran Smith, for everything you do, and mostly for being you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the thank interview. You.